When you include the force of kinetic friction in simple dynamical examples, it make those, makes those examples a little bit more complicated than the situations that we looked at earlier in dynamics when we had frictionless surfaces. So what I'm going to do in this particular lecture is I'm going to take a look at two specific problems that we examined in frictionless cases earlier in this unit, but now we're going to take into account the force of kinetic friction. We're going to take a look at the basic air track problem first. Let me go ahead and read that problem to you. Okay, so now this is the basic air track problem with friction. Given equal masses of one kilogram, just to keep things simple, and a coefficient of kinetic friction equal to 0.2, that's between the cart and the surface below, find the acceleration for the following two situations. The system is initially going to be moving to the right, and then secondly, the system is initially going to be moving to the left. So here's what I mean by that. Let's take a look at part A. Okay, so right here is our air track like so, but now we do take into account friction. Right here is the cart, M1, string, pulley, M2, like so. Both of the masses are the same, just to keep things easy. Okay, but then, in addition to that, we also have a coefficient of kinetic friction between these two surfaces here that's given to us as 0.2. Okay, now initially the motion that's given in part A of the problem is like so. M1 is moving to the right and M2 is moving downwards like so. Okay, now even though this mass here is rather large, it is physically possible for the objects to be initially moving like so, yet slowing down as they do. That would occur, for example, if there's enough friction between M1 and the surface below. It's also possible, due to the force of kinetic friction, that as the objects move like so, they actually may be moving at constant speed. That is, the acceleration could be equal to zero. And then lastly, even though there is friction here between M1 and the surface below, because M2 is rather heavy at one kilogram, probably what's going to happen is that the objects will actually just continue to speed up in this direction. They're probably going to accelerate like so. Now, I'm just making this assumption here. However, if I'm correct and we calculate the acceleration, we should end up with a positive value. Now, I'm just qualitatively describing the scenarios that can happen here in this situation with kinetic friction. Let's see what happens now as we start to examine the force diagrams exerted upon each object, and then ultimately what happens when we calculate out the acceleration. So now let's take a look at M1. Okay, so for M1 now, there are four forces acting on it. We have, first of all, the normal force upwards, N, and the weight M1G downwards. There's no acceleration vertically. So these forces just cancel out. Okay, like we saw in the hockey puck problem from the previous lecture, we do need to know what the normal force is in this example because that will then help us describe the force of kinetic friction a little bit later on. Okay, now as the object is getting pulled to the right-hand side, we have the tension vector from the string like so. It's initially moving to the right-hand side, so then therefore opposing the motion is the force of kinetic friction like so. Notice just from the force diagram itself that we can begin to see the three possibilities. That is, if this force vector is greater than this one, then the acceleration will be to the right-hand side. If the force vectors are equal to each other, they cancel each other out, and the acceleration is zero. If this force vector is bigger than this one, then the acceleration will be to the left-hand side, and the objects could slow down. So just from the force diagram alone, we start to see the physical possibilities that could occur. Okay, now let's add up the forces here horizontally. We have the force of tension, first of all, that's positive in the same direction as A, and then minus the force of kinetic friction in the opposite direction. So T minus F sub K is equal to M1A. Okay, now before we get to M2, we now take this equation and we carry it out as far as we can go. That means that at this point, we write the force of kinetic friction as the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by the normal force and now we go ahead and plug in the normal forces M1G into the expression here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and star this equation. This equation right here is going to be the first of two equations and two unknowns. The two unknowns are the tension, which we don't care about, and the acceleration A that we're trying to find. Okay, now let's take a look at M2. This is obviously where we're going to get our second expression from. Let me do that up here. All right, so for M2, there's no surface associated with M2. It's not in contact with anything. So we just have the tension upwards and the weight downwards. So tension T, M2G. Remember, we're assuming that the acceleration is downwards. And now when we add up the forces here, we just end up with M2G minus T 
and that then equals the net force M2A. Okay, so right there is the second now of my two equations and two unknowns, and at this point we just do the algebra. Okay, so let me go ahead and do the algebra here on the lower board. What I'm going to do is take the first expression and solve it for the tension. I'll do so by moving the friction term to the right-hand side of the equation. That then gives me this. And then I'll take this expression and I'll then plug it into the second equation. When I do, however, let's just be really careful here to distribute the negative sign through both terms. So be really careful of that. Okay, so now I'm going to have M2G minus T. So M2G minus this term here minus this term here, and this then equals M2A on the right-hand side of the expression. And now the only unknown is the acceleration A, which we can solve for. So to solve for the acceleration, I'll take this term here and move it to the other side. I'll also do a little bit of factoring here. I'm going to factor out the common acceleration A from each term as I do. So take a look at that carefully. And then the last step here, of course, is just to divide it then by the parentheses on both sides. And we then end up with the following expression for the acceleration. Like so. And now notice that all three physical possibilities are in fact described in this equation. Because, for example, in the numerator of the expression, this term here could be larger than this term. And then therefore the acceleration would be a positive value. This then means that the acceleration vector points in the direction that we assumed and then therefore the objects do in fact speed up. However, it's also possible that in the numerator of the expression, if there's enough friction for example, the two terms here cancel each other out and the acceleration is zero. And then therefore the objects would move at a constant speed. It's also possible if the friction is large enough that this term here is greater than this term. If that's the case, then the acceleration would be a negative number. This then means that the acceleration vector points in the opposite direction as we had guessed. Okay, lastly, before I plug in the numbers, and by the way, the acceleration will be positive. Before I plug in the numbers, notice what happens in the frictionless case. In the frictionless case, there's the equation that I originally derived for the air track demonstration back in chapter four. That's the frictionless case. Okay, let's go ahead and plug in the values here, and let's see what we end up with. As I said a moment ago, we are, in fact, going to get a positive value here. All right, so plugging in, I first of all have M2G, and then the minus UK times M1 times G, and then all divided by a total of 2 kilograms. And this ends up being 3.92 meters per second squared. So the objects do speed up in their original direction of motion, and they do so in an acceleration of 3.92 meters per second squared. And then in part B of the problem, what we're going to do is we're going to reverse the initial motion of the objects. In the frictionless case, this doesn't matter. However, now with friction, it does. As we'll see, there's only one physical possibility that could occur in such a scenario. Okay, let me do some erasing here. All right, so let's go back to this diagram here. Let's get rid of the work here for part A of the example. Okay, but now we're going to switch things up here a little bit in part B. So now what we're given in part B is that the initial motion of M1 is to the left-hand side. And then therefore this guy here, M2 that is, its initial motion is upwards. So imagine that I simply do the following. I take a hold of M1, I shove it to the left, and then I let go of it. And then the instant that I let go of it, that's when the problem begins. Okay, now, the instant that I let go of M1, is it physically possible for M1 to speed up in this direction after I let go of it? No. Is it physically possible for the two objects to move at a constant speed after I let go of M1? No. The only physical possibility, as we'll see, is that the objects will slow down. This then means that the acceleration vector is going to have to be in this direction. When we calculate it out in just a few moments, we will in fact find that the acceleration vector is in that direction, but it's going to be a totally different number than it was in part A of the example from earlier. Okay, now this is just kind of an assumption on my part, but just watch what happens now when we examine the forces acting on the objects, specifically for M1. Okay, so for M1, vertically, we once again just have the normal force here. 
and the weight M1 gene. They just cancel each other out. Okay, and then we still have the tension vector from the string to the right-hand side, but now opposing the motion, which is initially to the left, opposing that like so, is the force of kinetic friction. After I let go of M1, there is no force vector acting on M1 to the left-hand side. So therefore, it's physically impossible for M1 to speed up in this direction. It's physically impossible for it to move at a constant speed because in order to do so, there would have to be a force vector in this direction that's canceling these guys here. The only physical possibility is that the objects will slow down. Therefore, the acceleration vector must point to the right. Okay, now horizontally, let's go ahead and add up the forces. And when I do, mathematically, basically only one thing changes here from what we did earlier in part A of the example. Now, in this case, both the tension and the force of kinetic friction are in the same direction as A. So then, therefore, we have T plus F sub K is equal to M1A. So what has changed from earlier in part A of the example is that the negative sign that I originally had here has now become a positive sign. Okay, and then this right here is the coefficient multiplied by the normal force, and the normal force is once again equal to the object's weight. So let's go ahead and plug things in, like so. And then here's the first of my two equations and two unknowns. And then for the second equation, we once again take a look at M2. Nothing actually changes in the force diagram for M2. We still have the following. Okay, we still have the tension upwards. We still have the weight downwards. We have our acceleration vector like so. Remember that everything is slowing down. And now we add up the forces in the following way. M2G minus T equals the net force M2A. Okay, and then we run through the algebra once again by doing the following. I'm going to take this expression here and solve it for the tension, and then what I'll do is I'll plug it into here. So let's take this term here and move it to the other side. Like so. And then we'll take that expression for the tension, and then we'll plug it into here. Once again, I have to be careful to distribute the negative sign through both terms as I do. I'm going to do this on the lower board. So I'm going to have M2G minus T. So minus this, and then minus a negative gives me a positive, like so, equals then the net force M2A on the right-hand side of the expression. And now we just solve for A. So let's move this term here to the other side. I'll do a little bit of factoring here with the common acceleration as I do, like so. And then algebraically, the last step here is just to divide the parentheses to the other side. Like so. And now before I do, in fact, plug in my numbers here, notice that physically there's only one possibility here, and that's a positive number. So then therefore, the only thing that can happen is that the system slows down as I originally described. In addition to that, in the frictionless case, this term is gone, and then once again, there's the acceleration for a basic air track demonstration like so. In the frictionless case, the initial motion doesn't matter. Okay, let's calculate the number here. It's going to be a larger number than the 3.92 meters per second squared from part A of the example a little while ago. So plugging in everything. And this ends up being 5.88 meters per second squared. So the objects slow down faster in part B of this example, then they sped up in part A of the example. So when you introduce the force of kinetic friction into dynamical situations, that then complicates matters as we're seeing in this example and in now the one that follows. So for my last example for kinetic friction, what we're gonna do is take a look at what happens with the incline situation, but now we're gonna take friction into account. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some erasing here. Let's get rid of all of this. I'll have to move the file on my screen in just a moment as well. Okay, let me go ahead and get to the problem. Okay, let me go ahead and read the problem to you. This is the basic incline with friction. The angle of inclination is 30 degrees and the coefficient of kinetic friction equals 0.2. Find the acceleration for the following situations. The mass is initially moving down the slope. 
and then secondly, it's initially moving up the slope. We're going to see lots of similarities between this example and the one that we just completed. Okay, first of all, let's see what happens, for example, if I take the eraser and I send it down the slope. Immediately, there are three physical possibilities. For example, if the friction is small and the angle of inclination is large enough, after I let go of the eraser, it could still accelerate down the slope, still speed up, that is, like so. However, if the angle is just right and the friction is just right, let's see if I can do this properly, after I let go of the eraser, it could actually move down the incline at a constant speed, roughly something like that. It's also possible if the angle is shallow enough and, for example, the friction is large enough between the eraser and the incline, it's possible for the eraser to slow down after I let go of it, like so. So then therefore, when I set up F equals MA for this situation, we should see, once again, all three physical possibilities occur. Okay, so let's begin to diagram this out. All right, so right here is my inclined plane, like so. Here's the angle of inclination that's given to us as 30 degrees. Here's our object of mass M. Okay, the mass is not given in this example, as we'll see when we get far enough in the example, the mass will actually cancel from the expressions. Okay, and then we once again have a coefficient here, just equal to 0 0.2 for simplicity, and then part A of the problem, the motion of the eraser is down the slope, okay? Okay, now let's take a look at our force diagram. In the frictionless incline situation that we examined previously in dynamics, we had the following two force vectors. We had the normal force perpendicular to the incline, recall those details, and the force of gravity straight downwards. However, now opposing the motion has to be the force of kinetic friction acting on the eraser up the slope like so. Depending upon the neatness of your own force diagram, you may want to indicate that right here is a right angle. Okay, now what about the acceleration? Well, this is actually a rather steep angle, and this right here is a rather small coefficient. So probably what's going to happen, this is just my guess, is that the eraser is going to accelerate down the slope like so. I'm going to assume that it speeds up. Okay, now how do I add up the forces here using F equals ma? Well, notice that the force of gravity, once again, mg is on an angle with respect to the acceleration a. So then therefore I have to break it into components and recall how this is done. What you do is you come down from the normal force and you go across. When you do, right here is the angle of inclination theta like so. And now we add up the forces in the following way. First of all, perpendicular to the incline, there's no acceleration, so everything cancels out. That is the normal force here, cancels out with this adjacent component here of mg. This guy right here is mg cosine theta. Okay, now parallel to the incline, we have right here mg sine theta in the same direction as a, but now minus the force of kinetic friction in the opposite direction of a. So when I add up the forces parallel to the incline, we get mg sine theta minus fk equals ma. And now what we do is we write the force of kinetic friction here as the coefficient multiplied by the normal force. Let me go ahead and write in that step like so. And then here's where, once again, knowing the normal force is important, we now take this expression for the normal force, and then we plug it into here. Like so. Okay, and then it's this point here that the mass cancels out from the expression, so let's go ahead and get rid of that. And then here's our expression for the acceleration A. I'm just going to clean it up a little bit and rewrite it like so. So notice that mathematically there are three possibilities here. If this term here is larger than this term, then the acceleration is positive and the eraser speeds up, sliding down the slope. It's also possible, however, if everything balances out, if you will, that these two forces cancel each other out, or these two terms, rather, cancel each other out, and then therefore the acceleration is zero and the eraser moves down the slope at a constant speed. If the angle is shallow enough, if the friction is large enough, it's possible that this term here is greater than this term, and then therefore the acceleration would be a negative number, meaning that the eraser slows down. Before I plug in the numbers, however, notice what happens in the frictionless case. There's once again Galileo's free fall experiment of the frictionless incline. 
Okay, let's go ahead and plug in and see what we get. We are, in fact, going to get a positive number in this scenario because the amount of friction that's occurring here in the problem is rather small. All right, punching in everything, we end up with 3.2 meters per second squared, like so. So the eraser speeds up with that acceleration here in part A. And then lastly here for part B, now we're just gonna reverse the direction of the initial motion. And when we do the force diagram, it's gonna change a little bit. The equations are gonna change a little bit. As we'll also see, there's only one physical possibility. Let me actually describe that first before I draw this out. Okay, what I'm gonna do is take the eraser and then send it up the slope and let go of it. And then the instant that I let go of it, that's when the problem begins. Is it physically possible after I let go of the eraser for it to speed up in this direction? No. Is it physically possible for it to move up the slope at a constant speed after I let go of it? No. The only physical possibility is that the eraser slows down the instant that I let go of it, like so. So we should see that then happen in the situation when I draw my force diagram. All right, let's go ahead and erase all this. Okay, so now we're setting this up as part B. And we're given that the motion of the eraser is initially up the incline. And yes, as we'll see, the only thing that can happen is that the eraser slows down. The acceleration vector is still going to be down the slope. Okay, now, once again, three forces acting on the eraser. Two of them are basically the same as they were before. That is the normal force perpendicular to the incline, and then the force of gravity straight downwards. But now opposing the motion, which is up the slope, opposing that then is the force of kinetic friction, F sub K, like so. Once again, depending upon the neatness of your own force diagram, you may want to indicate that this right here is a right angle. Okay, we're still assuming that the acceleration vector looks like so, so I once again have to break up the force of gravity, mg, into its components. So we come down from the normal force and go across and doing so, right here is the angle theta. And then once again, we add things up here by using F equals ma. First of all, in this perpendicular direction, that is perpendicular to the incline, we have once again the normal force here canceling out with mg cosine theta. Like so. And now, Parallel to the incline, we once again have here mg sine theta pointing down in the direction of the acceleration, but then also plus the force of kinetic friction like so. So if you compare what I'm writing here to what I did earlier in part A of the example, basically what has changed here is that what was a negative sign for the force of kinetic friction is now positive. Okay, okay and then we write this term here as the coefficient multiplied by the normal force where the normal force is mg cosine theta. So, so I did a couple of minor steps there at once. Make sure you check that. Okay, then lastly, let's go ahead now and cancel out the mass from each term, like so. And when we do, we now have our equation for the acceleration. I'm just going to go ahead and rewrite it here for clarity. As I do, you'll note that physically the only thing that can happen here is that this can only be a positive number, thereby meaning that the only thing that can happen is that the eraser slows down when I let go of it. Before I plug in the numbers, Right here is the frictionless case, once again, of Galileo's free fall experiment. If there's no friction, then the initial motion doesn't matter. Okay, let's go ahead and plug in the numbers. And when I do, I'm going to get a number that is bigger than the one I did earlier in part A of the example. All right, so plugging in, let's see what I get. Uh, let's see, plus 0.2 times 9.8 times cosine is 30. And this comes out to be about 6.6 .6 meters per second squared. So the eraser actually slows down faster in part B of the example than it speeds up in part A of the example. You can actually see that very easily as a demonstration of the entire problem in the following way. So first of all, there's part B. Watch how quickly the eraser slows down, like so. That's basically this number here. But then for the same incline, now I'm gonna take the eraser and I'm gonna send it down the slope with an initial speed down the slope. And when I do it speeds up down the slope, but it does so at a lesser value of the acceleration. That is the lesser value that we found in part A, as opposed to this quantity here in part B. With a little bit of practice, kinetic friction is rather straightforward. When we continue the lectures, then we'll get to static friction.